of the scavengers game are simple food is good food that doesn't run even better find a novel approach he's just laying on it showing the world who's boss then a favorite dish grizzlies sniff out the mammary gland red foxes go for lips skunks flash a warning then relish the soft parts there's a lot now they all know the score fight against starvation. It's survival by any means necessary. I'll find Yellowstone's ultimate scavenger. Go on. High alert. Unless it finds me first. Sometimes the scavenger ends up being the scavenged. Like a lot of the animals in the area, I like to return to carcasses I've found over the years. And this one, I've had a lot of action on. Got a great situation here. The wolves killed a bison yesterday. And right now, I've got front row seats with two big gray wolves on it. Now I know there's grizzlies around, so I'm gonna sit back and see what happens. When the largest prize in Yellowstone goes down, Word travels fast. In a flash, a golden eagle arrives. Then, one of the largest scavengers on Earth. The lineup continues to grow. Well, now there's two grizzlies at the carcass, and they're kind of trying to push each other off. And while they're fighting, there's a lone wolf coming in and picking up the scraps. But this isn't a fair fight. And the big grizzly, he's not even eating. He's just laying on him, showing the wolves who's boss. Size appears to win the day, but in the world of scavengers, everything isn't as it seems. And the grizzly doesn't always come out on top. To see how these animals stack up, I return here, just outside Yellowstone. Bears are still sleeping. No. The robins are singing out there, so the bears are awake. There's a twist. I've brought along a second pair of eyes. My wife, actress Missy Pyle. Today, we start our search. National Geographic Channel presents A Planet in Motion. Grizzly style. We will scavenge on the same food grizzlies eat. That means no breakfast. So I didn't even get my boots tied. And just outside the cabin here, a big male grizzly has come off the hill. And there's only one bear that I know around here that looks like that bear, that's a bear I call walrus. This morning started off with a good cup of coffee and a bear sighting right off the bat. So we've they thrown our- the window of the cabin. Yeah, so we're through our packs on quick. Now we're gonna try to catch up. 
But one of the biggest issues is not forgetting that there are probably 50 other bears around here. So getting fixated on a bear like this can be fatal. We still haven't found the big boar. He's likely out here moving across the Surprising how good a bear, even of that size, can hide down in that sagebrush. So we're gonna climb up here, get a little elevation, and just look around, glass, and hopefully we'll spot him. During our ascent, a storm blows in. And our scavenger diet starts to take its toll. I must uh, eat something. Oh no, here comes the puns. I must eat something. Oh dear, I don't know if I can handle this anymore. Um, what do you think we should do? I think we should see if there's like a, like a bear bed and breakfast in there. So we can uh, see if there's a vacancy. It's our turn to experience the same forces which drive all scavengers, hunger and fatigue. There's a bear right out here. Right out here in the meadow. See it right over the top of the sagebrush? There's two bears. Three. Oh wait. There's a sow and three yearlings. So there's four bears. And it's just cool to see a female with three cubs. That's uh, yeah. pretty outstanding. She's done some good work. She's pretty incredible. A well-fed female grizzly births more cubs. And in Yellowstone, scavenging is where the energy is. Learning this lesson can make all the difference. Teach a cub to hunt and he'll eat for a day. Teach a cub to scavenge, and he'll eat for the rest of his life. Yeah, when they find a good little spot, they'll dig frantically. Usually it's like a little rodent trail, and they follow the trail to the end and then eat the rodent. Yeah. The secret weapon is their nose, a sense of smell that is 2,000 times sharper than a human's. But other scavengers already have a hint of what's going on. And the person that cued me off to these guys actually was that raven. Did you see the raven flying around? It's typical for a raven and other scavengers to just kind of hang out by bears like this. They leave little scraps here and there, and then the ravens will come down and scavenge. What he's doing right now, he's calling to the other ravens, letting them know there's a bear. And all the other ravens will start coming around and they'll follow that bear. It's a really cool relationship. Then another familiar face shows up. Exceptional hearing and little fear give the coyote its own competitive advantage. Like clockwork, the bears bring the ravens. The ravens alert the coyote. He's looking for the same thing those grizzly bears are looking for. Yeah, come along, he's just listening for him to scurry underneath the snow. He looks like he's got something locked. Don't oh, there he went. <laughs> so see, now the coyote's gonna go over and look and see where those grizzlies are. They actually benefit being close to the grizzly bear. Coyotes, ravens, and other scavengers learn to identify the grizzlies as a, a food source. For Yellowstone's boldest scavenger, look no further. Coyotes will track wolves back to their kill sites, despite the fact that wolves kill them anytime they get the chance. If we're going to eat, Missy and I have to embrace this attitude. After these bears leave, we should go over and look into their digs and see if there's anything we can eat. I mean, to rock, paper, scissors to see who eats the bowl. Why not? Let's not eat the I don't know if I want to eat the bowl, but like. Why not? Probably 
probably be uh, bad for you. But we could go over there, just like the raven, follow the bears in their dig spots, and mm -hmm. if there's like pieces of roots or anything like that, we can eat that. How did I get myself into this? <laughs> It'll be fun. <laughs> Over the years, I've scavenged from bears on a few occasions. This is like literally fresh Kodiak killed sushi. Pretty dang good. Now I'm gonna go with the muck tuck. Same thing that the polar bear down at the bone pile been raving about all week. Mm. Bears have good taste. get too comfortable here. Sow grizzlies with cubs are known for aggression towards humans. The bears suddenly turn and charge right for us. They're all getting a little worried about mom. Running right at her. When do we have to worry? It's just pay attention. I can't put our guard down. What's our plan? But the wind is whipping around so they can be smelling us or another bear. But it's just starting to get them nervous. The bears smell a threat, but they can't pinpoint our location. Finally, they decide to head out. I've seen mom. She's walking away. Mm -hmm. That's good. It's a tough choice. Fight or flight, but these bears follow Mama right out of harm's way. Hot on their heels, Missy and I cautiously investigate the digs. After a hard day's work, our prize seems insignificant, but no good scavenger would pass this up. You want to try one of those little bulbs? Yeah, I've had them before. You should try them. All right. They're chewy. Huh? They're chewy. I don't have much flavor either. Tastes like um corn. Pretty good. Could you eat a, a rodent? Would you? No. Maybe if like, you know, if it's cooked a little bit on a spit. Something tells me Missy and I might not be cut out for this. Maybe that's why grizzly bears don't survive purely as scavengers either. But so far. I've only gotten the smallest taste of the scavenger's life. To lure in the ultimate scavenger, I need to raise the stakes and find a fresh kill. In the world of scavengers, one thing you don't want to be is the last one to the carcass. Usually whoever gets the carcass first gets the most meat. Then it goes downhill from there. A carcass like this one is often fully consumed within the first 48 hours. Now, whether you have the smell of a grizzly bear or the eyesight of a raven, we as humans fall short when it comes to the senses. So what I have to use today when I'm looking for carcasses is my brain. definitely circling around something, and that's a great sign. Now, a turkey vulture is one of the only birds that can smell. And what they do is ride the thermals and look for dead things, basically smell dead things. For vultures, scavenging is a total way of life. Their acute sense of smell allows them to be one of the world's only exclusive vertebrate scavengers, feeding solely on carrion. But I need to meet one face to face. So today, I want to get close to one of my favorite scavengers. And to do so, I brought in a carcass. Meet Pilgrim, a rescued turkey vulture who works with handler Becky Keene as an ambassador bird to show a side of the vulture that is too often overlooked. Because they do such a dirty job, they're actually very uh, sophisticated in how they keep themselves clean. 
she's got no feathers on her head. Um, so when she's digging in those cavities, carrion is not sticking to her head. So uh, and they're cool. more of a social bird also, you know, you'll see them in uh, groups sometimes. So that's why she's kind of, she likes the entertainment. Odd as it seems, this carcass is not her idea of a party. So it's obvious that Pilgrim's not digging the carcass too much. It's big and a little scary. So what I'm going to do is grab the leg, a little smaller piece, and uh, bring it over here and see what she thinks. I'm going to put it right here. Pilgrim's showing off her big, beautiful wings and those beautiful feathers. They actually use them to defend the carcass and kind of take control. Probably the best tool they have for a carcass is that beak right there. And it's designed for ripping and tearing meat. But instead of demonstrating on the carcass, she's demonstrating it on my leg. Ow! Along with a powerful beak, vultures have another trick up their sleeve. To smell a carcass from the sky, they rely on these see-through nostrils. More airflow equals a better nose for death. A turkey vulture can actually smell a carcass up to 19 kilometers away. When I'm out in the wild, I often use turkey vultures to find other animals. They can find a carcass way before I ever can. This bird is definitely circling right over this ravine here, down kind of in this creek bottom. So there's a good chance there'd be something dead over there. So I'm going high alert right now. I know I'm getting close now because I can hear flies buzzing around. Oh, right there. I can see something land right there. Looks like a dead. It's a dead mule deer. Looks like it's been chewed on a little bit. And I'll tell you what, right now, if you had smell-o-vision, you would turn the TV off because it stinks. This is a great situation. It's just what I've been looking for. Almost a full carcass with a lot of meat left. So I'm going to take it up a notch. I'm going to do a full-on scavenger stakeout. Tonight, I hope to see which scavenger takes the cake. First, I've got some work to do. Well, the next step is to build a shelter I can hide, sit back, and monitor my cameras. And the best shelter I can build is the same shelter a Native American of this area would build, and that's a wikiup. Now, I'm going to have to go in scavenger mode myself, go around, gather all the building material that lays right here in the forest, I think this is a perfect spot. Wikiups are quick to build, easy to abandon, and sturdy enough that many still stand to this day in Yellowstone. Man, this thing's looking awesome. Super camouflage, sealed up good. And I've got one last thing I gotta do before the stakeout tonight. 
check this out. And that is gonna allow me to watch these infrared cameras under the cover of darkness. All I've gotta do is get this in the right position, run this cable out over to the carcass. Sun's going down. It's time to get into the blind, get all my camera set. Get things in night mode here. Looks good. I've got my full infrared set up ready. Now I'm just gonna sneak back to my wiki up. Sit tight and watch what happens tonight. It's one thing just to set up remote cameras, go back and review the footage, but I really just want to be here next to this carcass, actually experience these animals coming in. It's a long shot, but if it happens, it'll be really, really cool. Nothing on the camera yet, though. Usually, they provide the kills. Last winter, I stalked these secretive ambush predators. How cool is that? Mountain lions kill animals up to eight times their size. They'll consume up to 11 kilograms in a single sitting, but that still means a lot of leftovers. I saw numerous scavengers take advantage of mountain lion kills, and one that is almost never seen in the wild the pine marten. In summer, the pine marten is a prodigious hunter of red squirrels. But come winter, squirrels are less active. The marten looks elsewhere and finds a bounty. Just up here is a pine marten. They live in these thick forests, so they're very, very difficult to see. They like to eat squirrels, chipmunks, but they'll even raid birds' nests. But they're also very effective scavengers. Stealing a killer's dinner is a risky strategy, but Martins have an exit plan. Filmed with a high-speed camera, the dexterity of these fleet-footed weasels comes alive. This is what keeps them from becoming a mountain lion's next meal. And they can just move through the trees like I've never seen. Beckett and his handler, Steve Crushel, give me a close-up view. They're double-jointed. Their front feet and back feet are double-jointed, Casey, so they can go up and down with, uh, with no problem. This show was created for you and your family to watch together. Welcome to Nacho Wild. There he goes. It's a unique adaptation that Martins have. They can go straight down a tree head first. Yeah, he's an amazing climber. Yeah, look at that. So they can climb as fast as a squirrel. Whoa, he is like lightning. <laughs> you are so fast. Martins showcase a talent for survival but not dominance. When push comes to shove, speed only gets you so far. The real contest will be settled here at the deer carcass as soon as the lion leaves.
something like that happens, it feels pretty good. that does it all. As a pack, they kill. Yellowstone's wolves kill and eat an elk every two to three days. But on their own, they're elite scavengers. The wolf's stomach stores up to 10 kilograms, enough to survive for weeks without any fresh meat. In a pinch, they'll live off just hide and bone. He's acting hesitant. Something's up. This wolf wants no part of the carcass. Without the protection of the pack, he looks vulnerable, even shy. Then, he's gone. That was a long night without much action last night. Man, this thing has gone from smelling bad to smelling really disgusting. If you look right back there, there's definitely some scavenging going on. The maggots have erupted, and they are starting to devour this thing. Now, we're not talking just a few maggots. We're talking millions of maggots, all different ages. It's like a river of maggots moving in and out of this carcass. And you can see the steam coming up, and this thing is really alive, even though it's dead. Maggots are the secret weapon in the scavenger world. What they lack in size, they make up for in force. The maggot mass generates heat as it digests. It can reach a blistering 53 degrees Celsius. And heat means steam. Millions of these tiny insects can liquefy and devour 60% of a carcass in just three days growing to five times their original size. Oh, you look right down in there, there's some other insects. See this little orange and black beetle right there and right here? Those are carrion beetles. They're meat-eating beetles, and they will do their part to destroy this carcass, too. Carcasses in Yellowstone play host to a staggering amount of insect life. Over 400 species of beetles alone Believe it or not, there's plenty of animals that would come over here and eat this. Insects may win as an army, but they quickly become prey for another group of scavengers, the avifauna. <laughs> to be the ultimate scavenger, one quality stands above the rest, intelligence. And the ravens got it. But to see it in action, I need a bird's eye view. Way up that tree is a nest. Now I think it's active, but there's only one way to find out. You might wonder why I have a bow and arrow. Well, this arrow's been equipped with a 
long, lightweight string. Just shoot this arrow up over a limb, grab the string, tie a climbing rope to it, and climb up to the nest. Now, once I'm at the nest, I'm gonna fix a little remote camera so I can see what these little raven chicks are up to. Now for the hard part. Not too bad. And you can hear Mama and Daddy Raven are not very happy. Try to do this quick to minimize impact on the nest. Get out of here. All right, clip in and up I go. I wish I could fly like a raven. When I get close to the nest here, it actually smells like a carcass. There's a reason for the smell. Ravens return to the nest with morsels from the carcass to feed the chicks. I can hear the little guys in there. But uh, now, I'm past my anchor, so got a little climbing difficulty to add to it, so there we go. Now they think I'm mom. They're laying down tight, keeping warm, opening their mouths to be fed. These little guys don't know any better yet. They just think I'm a funny looking raven. It's gonna be really cool to watch these little ravens grow up. The chicks are right on time. The raven hatch coincides with peak food availability. It's one of the big reasons ravens are the most abundant avian scavenger in Yellowstone. The other reason is a peculiar intelligence that is still dimly understood. They use beaks and wings to communicate with human-like gestures. They arrive in swarms to overwhelm larger scavengers. And they connect the sound of gunshots to fallen carcasses nearby. New research suggests their intellect matches that of chimps and gorillas. A few more flight lessons and they'll arrive here, in the middle of the action. But the raven smarts don't make it top bird in Yellowstone's pecking order. That honor is irrefutably held by an eagle. To see a bald eagle in its scavenging prime, I leave Yellowstone for a place that's equally wild. Southeast Alaska at the peak of the fall salmon run. And I'm here to witness one of the biggest scavenging events that I've ever seen. Amazing. This gathering of the eagles on the Chilkat River is the largest concentration of bald eagles found anywhere on the planet. Thousands of bald eagles have come to these shores to feed on the dying remains of chum salmon just after they spawn. While most people think of the bald eagle as a mighty hunter, these birds have come here to scavenge on the leftovers. Salmon are a rich food source. More importantly, they die immediately after they spawn. For bald eagles, a trip of up to 1,600 kilometers is more than worth it. There might look like plenty to go around, but when it comes to food, it's every bird for itself. While these eagles don't have much competition from other scavengers like they do in other places, they sure compete amongst themselves. White heads and tails alert other eagles to a food source. 
but they also reflect status and rank. It's really apparent that these eagles have a pecking order with the dominant eagles eating most of the carcasses. It's a simple message. This fish, I don't think so. Out here, nothing's wasted, even the eyeballs. Scavengers really complete the circle of life. When these salmon swim up these rivers and die, the eagles find new life in them. It's really quite a beautiful thing. And life goes on. And what a beautiful place for life to go on. Scavenger's work is never done. It's time to return to the stakeout. And someone has paid a visit. Unbelievable. My wiki up is just right over there. If you look here, you can see where a bear used its jaw pressure to bust open the bone, eat out the marrow, and lay it right here and matted the grass down. Pretty cool. Lucky for me, the carcass is still intact but I don't want a repeat of last time. Preparing for days, and then have a wolf come in and for him to go away. So this is a real bummer. It's possible the wolf caught wind of my human scent. To put the odds in my favor, I need to be undetectable. I don't want animals to come back here and get scared away because they know I've been here putting cameras up, so this stuff will kill the scent. The wait is on, again. Had a couple animals come really close to coming into the carcass, but didn't happen. We can't afford to have another long night here. Too many more nights, and the maggots are gonna eat the whole thing. Then, I'd recognize those stripes anywhere. Now this is a scavenger with a unique formula for success. The pungent cocktail of skunk spray. Last spring, these little stink bombs invaded my backyard and set up shop on the remnants of a deer carcass. But this little guy hasn't learned his best defense yet. So right now, he's charging me just like a grizzly bear. You're pretty tough, aren't you? But soon, there's no way I would ever get this close. Newborn skunks spray at just one week old, but they can't aim until they hit four weeks old. This guy is right on the verge. As long as that butt stays away from me, I'm okay. Moving a skunk baby to a carcass. Eh, not the smartest thing I've ever done. Outside the wiki up, things get more interesting by the second. Definitely the family of skunks, but they have a friend along. <laughs> oh. And they're not getting along, so I don't think they're friends. A little more tooth and claw, and this stink bomb might explode. The raccoon may be outnumbered, but size, razor sharp claws, and lightning quick reflexes allow him to hold his own, at least for the moment. I'll tell you, skunks are brave. They're like little grizzly bears. They just charge right in there. Ooh, 
while. Oh. I think that time, the skunk made a direct hit. The raccoon's trying to clean himself with a spray. Skunk spray is like tear gas, a volatile brew of noxious compounds that chemically irritate eyes and sinuses. I'm sure things don't taste very good when you have odor de la skunk right on your face. Something tells me this raccoon won't push his luck next time. So in the battle of this carcass, the skunks win. Inside the wikiup, the night is still young. scavenger beyond physical prowess and pack collaboration they have an X factor the power to surprise a healthy adult bison was once considered unkillable by any predator in Yellowstone but wolves taught this bison its lesson the hard way years have passed and bacteria and insects continue to scavenge. But one time I returned to this carcass and I had a very powerful moment. Check, check, one, two. Right about the time we get the camera set up, the bison begin to take notice. He smells their friend hurt. With the camera rolling, we back off. You've come to protect your friend. Yeah, let's go back over here. That bull is a giant. It's amazing. They started getting kind of rowdy and so it's a good chance that that was a bison that they knew, part of their herd. We just backed out of there. We don't want to get in the way of a herd of bison that's upset. 
And that bull who came in, he made some of the most wicked, crazy noises I've never heard in my life. So we'll let them pay their respects, and uh, we'll hang out back here and respect them. And hopefully they don't knock the camera over. Spectacular, something I've never seen before. This mystifying funeral rite has never before been documented on film. A single wild bison carcass amidst the oldest living herd in lower North America becomes somehow something more. They came over here and it was like they were paying their respects to their fallen friend here, completely out of the blue. something I'll never forget. After all I've seen, I'm beginning to think the ultimate scavenger can't be measured by size, speed, strength, or skill. Instead, it's the animal that understands how to best use everything it has. To keep playing the game in this world or the next. Channel presents a planet in motion. Yeah.